Hello, hello, hello. All right. All right, friends, I am just getting myself set up here um, and giving it a couple minutes for a few more people to hop in. And we will get started. All right, lovely people. We are about to get the party started. If you are joining us live, drop your name or a comment just so I know who is with me tonight. And we'll give it about um, one more minute and then we'll get started. Hey, Miss Wanda. Oh, hi, Miss Stevens. Hey, Harper and C3 Mama. Miss Wanda. Hey, what's been going on, Miss Wanda? All my rich and poop I missed. Love, love, love seeing when y'all are here with me. Awesome, awesome. All right. So let's go ahead and kick off. 
I have um, a few announcements here to kick us off. So um, just as a refresher, we do these Bible studies on the first Tuesday of every month right here on Facebook and YouTube Live. So if you're looking for me on a first Tuesday at around 7.30 p.m. Central, you can find me here most of the time. Hmm. We also do community coaching inside our Facebook group on the third Tuesday of each month um, because that um, I like to have that be a more intimate setting. Um, we only do that within the Facebook group. Uh, think about it as just kind of like discipleship time by way of coaching. Sometimes that may be topic specific. Sometimes that may just be bring your burdens before the Lord. OK, so um, if you ever want to take part in community coaching that is inside our Facebook group, specifically on the third Tuesday of each month, our Facebook group is just a radical community. If you search for that, for my people who are live with me or watching the replay and you are here in Memphis, Maine, if you are in Memphis, Maine and you are a female, we have an in-person event coming up for you on September 16th. We'll be doing brunch at Big Bad Breakfast on Poplar Avenue. Ladies, we would love for you to come out, get acquainted. This is going to kick off our fall events, a series of fall, fall events. So we want everybody to kind of come out, get to know each other a little bit first and get acquainted, get to know some other women that are in the radical community. And then this uh, first event is going to be followed up by a more intimate brunch um, plus devotional that's going to be hosted um, in our home. Either Bri or I, we're going to decide whose house we're going to host that at. Um, and that'll be brunch plus devotional for a smaller group. And then we're going to be doing some prayer and worship nights this fall as well, which I am super excited about that to just come and don't nothing have to be prepared by way of the Bible. It's just, let's just come and see how the spirit moves. Ordra, hey sis, good to have you with us tonight. Um, so yeah, if you are free on September 16th for brunch, we do have um, a Facebook event that you can RSVP to for that. And I am going to drop that link here in the chat for anyone. Um, who may want to join us for that. Mm, that might just be on YouTube. I'm gonna have to double check that. But there is a Facebook event for the brunch happening on the 16th. Uh, what else do we have? If you feel led, we would love your support financially. We are officially a nonprofit, praise the Lord, which means that all donations are tax exempt. Um, donations to a radical relationship go towards our annual budget, which covers social media related costs, operating costs and gifts to those who volunteer to serve our ministry. So um, as my friends say, if you feel it in your shanana to support us financially, I uh, would love to have that. We do have a donate lead link um, that you can use to donate. And then lastly, uh, four ways that you can tap in with us, um, our YouTube channel, our podcast, our email list, which goes out um, twice a month, and then in our Facebook group, which we are in the most consistently. And you can pretty much get to any of those places from our website, a radical relationship dot. Come. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So that is the announcements. I wanted to start tonight actually by spending some time in prayer. Um, typically on Monday nights, we send out prayer requests to um, our radical community via text. And so um, I want to spend some time in prayer over those things. If you have any prayer requests, um, feel free to drop um, those in the chat as well. Um, and we can cover some of those in prayer. Um, so I'm going to be looking at the screen here just because I want to keep the specific request top of mind. But um, if you can, would love for you all to just posture yourselves in a manner for us to pray together. <sighs> all right. Father God, we thank you so much um, just for every opportunity that we get to come before you. Um, we thank you, Father, that you have 
grafted us into your kingdom and we get to call ourselves sons and daughters of a king, of the one and only king. We thank you, Father, that um, in your kindness, you've just looked down on us um, and saw fit to keep us. I'm reminded each and every day um, when I think about just events in my life that I'm like, man, God, it is you and you alone that have kept us. And so, Father, we just want to posture ourselves with gratitude to say, man, no matter what may be going on in our lives, no matter what circumstances we may be experiencing that are not ideal and that we will want to change, uh, we just want to posture ourselves with gratitude to say thank you. Thank you that you have kept us despite um, any and all circumstances that we have endured. And Father, help us to just continuously position ourselves um, as little children with that childlike childlike faith before you. Um, want to just spend some time covering some of these specific um, prayer requests from the radical community. Um, we have members in the community, Father, that are asking for prayer, that they can just trust your process in the season that they're in. We know that that can be extremely hard, especially when we don't understand, Father. And so um, we just ask for those community members that are having a hard time surrendering and trusting where it is that you have them right now in this season of life, that your Holy Spirit will just be the comfort, that you would guide them with divine wisdom, divine understanding, Father, and that um, even when they can't see with their physical eyes, that they grow to see with their spiritual eyes, Father, and that even when the circumstances in the flesh um, don't look like what they want them to look like, that there can be a peace that surpasses all understanding because they're trusting in you, um, the one that never fails them. Father, we have prayer requests coming in for the radical community, just for um, sons and daughters to be covered, um, for children of our radical community to be seeking you, to be connected to their, their spiritual families. And so, Father, we want to cover all of the children of the men and women in the radical community, Father, and just ask that you would do a new thing in their lives. We know um, that you are beginning to raise them up at, at even a young age. And so, God, we know that it's never too early for them to start experiencing you. And so we just pray um, divine covering, Father, over the children and all of the different age groups that um, their hearts would just turn towards you and that their desire would be for you above all other things. I pray, Father, for the small groups that the men and women within the radical community are connected to, even outside of the radical community. And I pray for their spiritual communities, their church communities, Father, that those will be thriving spiritual communities. Um, we pray, Father, for any spiritual warfare that may be going on in the communities that they're attached to, um, that they will be able to see and recognize those and that they will fight with spiritual weapons and not the weapons of the flesh, Father. And that um, even in the moment that your Holy Spirit will be teaching them how to war in the spirit based on the specific circumstances that they are encountering. And we thank you and praise you for that victory in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for that. Uh, we pray for those men and women who are uh, in school and pursuing degrees and chasing their dreams. Father, they're looking for the test taking strategies. They're staying hopeful and faithful for good test scores. Uh, we have a number of um, prayer requests that have come through specifically around uh, financial increase and financial aid for schools specifically and for your wisdom and discernment for the next financial move. And so, God, we just want to cover um, all of the members of the radical community and specifically the financial situations um, that you would give the increase as you see fit, God, that you will open the doors for the jobs as you see fit. For those of us that are pursuing entrepreneurship, that our strategies would be divinely given by you, Father, that we would be able to rest in the comfort that you know all and that you see all and that we wouldn't be pressed. Father, help us to not be pressed when it comes to the money, but help us to instead choose to fix our minds and fix our thoughts and seek ye first the kingdom of heaven so that all these things will be added to us, Father. Uh, we pray for our community members that they will have boldness to spread your word more, um, that they would just grow sensitive to the needs of those around them, sensitive to the Holy Spirit, that you would begin to speak to the community members about the needs of those around them, that it, when they're in the grocery stores, when they're at school, when they're in the house, um, that your gentle whisper will begin to speak and that we can all grow in boldness to be able to speak to and speak about you um, in our communities and in our surrounding areas, Father. We pray 
um, for our community members, just that they would be accepting of your will to be done in their life, that they would continue to have the strength to move forward and what it is that you have put on their plate. Um, Father, we know that these men and women desire to please you more than anything. And so whatever that thing is, that is your good and perfect will for them in this season, Father, we pray that you would just help them to walk in that with confidence, to not be burdened by wondering if they're on the right path and being double-minded and Satan being able to accuse them, um, to get them you know, confused about what path that they're on, but they would be able to walk the path that you put in front of them with so much confidence and with the boldness that um, they haven't had before. We, we pray, Father, just over all of the families represented um, in the radical community and that all the families, um, all the family units will continue to grow um, in their walk with the Lord. We pray, Father, specifically that um, you would just grant so much growth and clarity in this season, Father, for the men and women that are seeking you about next steps and for the men and women who are burdened by areas that they really uh, want to grow in. We pray, Lord God, that you would meet them in the secret place, that you will reassure them that you're with them and that you would just start to highlight to them the answers that they're looking for as they seek clarity. And then lastly, Father, we just pray for obedience uh, for all the members of the radical community, God, that um, as they continue to seek your face and as you reveal answers that they won't turn a blind eye, but that they will be quick to be obedient to your voice, Father, um, that they just won't also be seekers of the word, but that they will also be doers of the word, that as you highlight things to them in scripture, through other people, and through sermons, um, that they will run to do good. We pray that all seed that is sown in their lives is sown in good soil, that it takes deep root, that it produces more much fruit in their lives, that we will be men and women that um, are soldiers on your battlefield, that will be radical for Christ, right? That will be confident um, in who it is that we serve, that we'll be bold and in, in going against the ways of the world so that we can hear, well done, my good and faithful servant at the end of our lives. And so God, we thank you um, and we cover the community members and we wait in eager expectation to see how your spirit will continue to move in the lives of these men and women. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. 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 If you're with me still drop an amen in the chat. Cover that prayer. Um, man, that's probably my favorite part of communing with the community is just seeing those prayer requests come in and just being able to um, cover those and hear y'all's hearts through the prayer request. So amen, amen, amen. Awesome. So tonight for Bible study, we are getting into the book of Ruth and we are talking about love, loyalty, and friendship. Lessons from Ruth and Naomi. And for my men that are joining us, no worries, because Ruth and Naomi got some lessons for y'all too, okay? <laughs> These lessons are universal. They are co-ed. Um, one of the things that's just been on my heart is just being in the word. <laughs> I saw a post, I reposted it to my story the other day that was like, please stop adding to the word of God. Just, just give me the word. <laughs> Just give me the, the good old word of God and let it speak for itself. And so I've just been thinking about that so much. Like it just irks me to hear a sermon and like it's like 90% of them just like talking and 10% the word of God. And I'm like, give me more word. And so tonight to kick off, I literally just want to read the word of God. <laughs> okay. So um, if you do have your Bibles with you tonight, we are going to be in Ruth chapter one. Now, Ruth is a little short, little quick little book of four chapters. And so when I was looking for it earlier, I couldn't find it and I see it. I know I know my word. OK, <laughs> I know I know the word of God and I cannot find this book. OK, so for any of y'all that are like me. All right. It's early. New Te it's early Old Testament right after Judges, right before 1 Samuel, four little chapters tucked in. If you blink, you'll miss them. So Ruth chapter one, 
Uh, we'll read the entire chapter, which is 22 verses. And it says, in the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malon, fact check me on that, and Kilian. <laughs> they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, not to be confused with Oprah, <laughs> Orpah, and the other a woman named Ruth. But about 10 years later, both Malon and Kilian died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. So the scene is starting out real destitute, okay? It's a famine, people dying, people being left alone. It's like, okay, Lord, what are we doing here? So verse six, then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. When her, excuse me, when her two daughters-in-law, with her two daughters-in-law, she set out from the place where she had been living and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back to your mother's home and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not. My daughters, things are far more bitter for me than for you because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. And again, they wept together. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. Verse 16, but Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. And here's the famous verse. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. So the two of them continued on their journey. And when they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? The women asked, don't call me Naomi. She responded, instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest. All right, that's a whole chapter, y'all. A whole chapter, Ruth chapter one. Whew. So let's get into the good stuff. So the first thing that I want to do when I started um, doing this, preparing this Bible study for you all today. <laughs> Don't tell nobody. I was a little behind. When I started preparing this Bible study, the first thing that I went to do was look up the meaning of the names of some of the main characters. And so we start out with the husband, Elimelech, uh, his wife, Naomi. They have uh, two sons and then they have two daughters-in-law. So Elimelech, 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 because y'all know how the Bible names be doing. If you're looking for a tongue twister, just go to the Bible. <laughs> if you want to have a little wordplay, just go to the Bible. So we're going to call Elimelech, 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 whatever the name is, we're going to call him Big E. Okay. That's what we're going to do tonight. Tonight, we're going to call him Big E and we're going to make it simple. 
or dr yes baby <laughs> because i can't do this all night with the bible so big e okay big e his name means my god is king Ooh, for off rip i said now that my man daddy knew what they were doing okay because then you got people like me whose first name is quanteria and i'm still like mama what it mean can can anybody tell me what it mean but big e big e's parents said listen his name will proclaim that god is king so his name means my god is king and i can only imagine that that gives us some type of insight into what type of man of god he was right and so then biggie his wife's name is naomi and naomi's name means sweet and pleasant which as we read about naomi and we take in her responses in this rough season of her life that's not hard to believe it's not hard to believe that her name means sweet and pleasant okay and then we have ruth her name means friend friendship or compassionate friend that is also not hard to believe <laughs> because once we start to get in into her responses in this less than ideal situation it's like okay I can believe that. I can believe that her name means friend, friendship, or compassionate friend. So in verses one through five, we have the stage being set. It first starts out in the very first verse, a severe famine came upon the land. So already it's just hitting the fan, okay? It's, it's, not, it's not going well. There's a famine in the land that's causing these people to have to relocate. So it's already given ghetto, all right? So one of the interesting things in this, these first five verses is that you see this progression taking place that, hey, Carrie, sis, you see this progression taking place that's very subtle in scripture. It starts out by saying, um, that they, uh, one version says in verse one that he left his home and went to live in a country. A different version, um, my English standard translation, which this is the big boy. Maybe y'all can tell it's got all of the notes in it. The ESV version in verse one, it says they went to sojourn, so, sojourn, S O J O U R N, sojourn in the country of Moab. And when you go to sojourn, that means you stay temporarily in a place. So they're leaving this place um, because there is a famine going on, but the intent isn't to stay because we see by the word language that's used in a different version that it's a temporary stay. So it starts out in verse one saying, hey, they left this place kind of temporarily um and then we see that we see that language change from they went to sojourn to they lived there um this was in verse um two and then um you see you see the the language continue to progress from like they, they left their famine to sojourn there. That means that they were there temporarily. And then they lived there. And then in verse three, it says that they remained there. And so it's like, okay. So at this point, we hear, yes, Naomi Sweeten. Yes, love that, um, Ordra. And so one of the things that that really made me think about as I looked at the, the word choice here and the progression of going from sojourning there to living there to remaining there is that they've been forced into a more permanent position when it was supposed to be temporary, right? So think of a time in your life where you're like, okay, I was good if it was going to last like this long. 
And you know, when it started to last like this long, it was like, okay, you know, we getting a little wobbly. And then when it started to last this long, it's like, all right now, just stop it, just stop it. But can you imagine leaving your land, your homeland because of a famine thinking, okay, well, we just gonna go relocate real quick because we, we want to wait out this famine and let it subside. And then you end up being there 10 years in a place that is not your home, in a place that you didn't necessarily want to be in, but conditions force you into. And that can be symbolic of so much, right? That can be symbolic of any situation in life that you like, I didn't necessarily choose this. <laughs> Circumstances kind of forced me into this position. And okay, God, if I need to stay here faithfully for a little bit, cool. If I need to stay here for a little bit longer, cool. But hold up. Because what we find out when we um, continue reading here is that they were there for 10 years. 10 years. And so one of the things that was interesting about this whole 10 year occurrence is that 10 years tends to look like the breaking point for people when it comes to their faith. And one of the references that the study Bible gives um, around that went back to Sarah and Abraham. It was at that 10 year mark when Sarah said, okay, I don't have a child enough of this. Let me go ahead and take care of this myself, right? And she brings in the servant girl for Abraham to sleep with and bear a child because she's like, surely this is how it's going to be done. It was at that 10 year mark. And so that's interesting, right? Which is which is funny to me because I'm like 10 years and that's when y'all start to break. Praise the Lord, saints, because for me, a year, <laughs> two years max. And I'm like, when, when you coming? I've been took it into my own hands. So I'm like 10 years, praise the Lord, saints. But 10 years tends to be that breaking point for people in scripture where it's just like, all right, nah, this is 10, 10 days, baby. It's like, listen, a little bit over a week. <laughs> How much longer you want me in here? And so they, they get to this 10 year mark, right? And her sons die. And so now, not only is she a widow, but the two sons that she has are now dead. And yes, they were married, but they didn't leave her any grandchildren. And so she is literally only left with these daughters-in-law who, you know, ain't technically her blood. And so that's the type of situation where it's like, I mean, that's cool, but they ain't my sons. You know what I'm saying? We can get put in those situations in life where you're just trying to be grateful <laughs> with what it is that you have. And it's like, I mean, that's cool, but it's not the thing that I actually wanted. And so I just start to think about, you know, this situation that Naomi has been put in, like, man, my God, when is enough enough? She's been uprooted from her home. She didn't lost the love of her life. She's been here living this thing out in faith for 10 years, only for that to result in her losing her two sons. And now she's literally left with nothing. And so the first question that I want to pose um, to you all tonight is, is what's your breaking point? What's the point in which you go, okay, God, enough of this. And then you feel like it's time to take things into your own hands because he ain't, he ain't moving the way that you want him to move. I remember um, when I first became a Christian, the first person who discipled me, she asked me, you know, Shel, what would be the thing that would make you walk away? What's that thing that you like? you know, me and God cool until, right? Um, and I knew that she asked me this question because she wanted to nip this in the bud to begin with, like, whatever you think that thing is that can cause you to walk away, let's go ahead and tackle it now. Because if we can tackle that on the front end, 
we can get you to finish this race, right? And so my answer to her question at that time was um, more death of loved ones that I couldn't make sense of. Because at that time I had experienced um, in high school, I had experienced the death of my boyfriend that I was dating at the time unexpectedly um, collapsed playing basketball, didn't survive. I had experienced the death of my grandma unexpectedly. She was young, like not even 60 years old, perfectly healthy one day, the next day, brain aneurysm in the hospital for um, a couple weeks, don't recover. Uh, in college, the mom of the boyfriend that had passed away gets cancer, passes away. You know, the type of things where you just like, what? And so it wasn't that I couldn't handle death. Like I had experienced death that didn't make me question my faith, right? When my great grandmother passed away, it's like, okay, you know, mom Polly, she'd been here with us for a while to God be the glory. When great aunts passed away, those I could make sense of. They had lived full lives. They had legacies left behind them. I, I had time to experience with them in the capacity um, that I felt was owed to me. But for people who felt like they were taken away from me too soon, for things that felt like it was ripped from my hands and I, I couldn't make Faith, uh, sense of it by way of faith of like, I can reconcile what God is doing here. I was like that right there. I'm tired of that. So I don't know, like if me and God can't get down for him to really help me out in this area, I just don't know. And so um, we wrestled through that a little bit. And then it was, I see that was 2014. And so it was 2016 when I ended up being faced with that very thing. Um, uncle of mine, night before 4th of July, uh, leaves home just like any other night on his motorcycle and doesn't even make it to his destination when he's hit by a car and um, spends the next couple weeks um, in the hospital before my family having to make the decision to um, take him off life support. And it was like right after I got married, you know. And thankfully, um, by the time that I experienced the thing that I thought would be, you know, the end all be all for me and my relationship with God in so many ways, my, my faith had been strengthened enough that even when I didn't understand, I could be like, man, I don't know what God is up to. I don't know why he would allow such a thing like this. I would definitely prefer this to be different, but God, but God. I had just got to a point in my faith where I was just like, man, I'm, I'm past the point of having to understand because that's the level where my trust is with God. That like even when my human brain don't comprehend and I can't make sense of it because I know his character and because I know that he's good. But God, you know, and so I want us to really consider like what is our breaking point? What is that thing that would make us get to that point, you know, where we say, man, I don't really know about this thing. And so I could, I could relate to Naomi as I um, was studying this out, experiencing all this death that she has and literally left her without, without anything. And so she had a good reason to feel like she had been abandoned by God. Like I think anybody would look at her situation and be like, yeah, I feel that. I feel that. I could also relate to Naomi and feeling like, bruh, I did what I was supposed to do. You know, it's different when you've been like living life on the edge a little bit and you like, okay, maybe I brought that on myself. <laughs> maybe I deserve that. But when you feel like you have done what it is that you're supposed to do and you have been a good servant on the battlefield and <laughs> you have been faithful and stuff like this happened. It's like, what, what else do you want from me? Right? Because somewhere in our minds, there's this underlying assumption that um, serving God well entitles us to lack of, you know, things. 
uh, I shouldn't be going through this because I did things the right way. Why is this my portion? You know, if if this is how it was going to end up and it was going to feel like this anyway, then why even do the right thing? <laughs> you know, man, I can relate to Naomi where it's just like, Lord, you know, what else do you want from me? Like not even one grandchild. You couldn't even give me that. Like there are so many reasons for Naomi to just chuck the deuces like, mm -mm, mm -mm. OK, so again, what's it for you? What's what's that entitlement thing that makes you feel like I don't I don't deserve this, though? Definitely take some time to dwell on that with God. Hey, Jolene, take some time to dwell on that with God and work the thing out with him, you know, with those emotions. Recently, I heard a friend say something that was just very powerful in the moment. And what she said was, if God makes me wait even longer for this miracle, yes, I'm going to be pissed off. That's true. I'm going to be pissed. Because like, what? Why you got me wait even longer? But I'm going to wait. Because what else I'm going to do? <laughs> because what else am I going to do? And so I want us to be women of faith and men of faith that like that. Like we can be honest that like, I ain't going to lie, I'm not happy about this. And we can be honest like that in our relationship with God that like, I'm, I'm not feeling it. This don't feel good. I'm not welcoming this with open arms. I don't feel super faithful or hopeful, hopeful in this moment. What I, what I am going to do is be obedient though. What you're not going to do is knock me off my rocker. I might wobble a little bit and shake, but what you're not going to do is knock me down. I'm going to be back up. Give me a couple of days, a little tears, might have some bruises, you know, <laughs> might uh, have done a little stress eating, but I will be back. Give me time. Right. So <laughs> Felicia, just like gas prices, not complaining because I'm sure. <laughs> right. But what I'm going to do is pay for that. <laughs> Pay for that gas. What I'm gonna do is cry every day. <laughs> Bree said, but I'm but I'm awake. <laughs> I'm crying and wait. I'm crying and wait. <laughs> yes. So verses six through 18, they really get into uh the part of this passage that exhibits the loyalty. Um, we see this back and forth start to go on where Naomi is like, no, nah, y'all go, you know, like there's so much of your life ahead of you. And at first, Ruth and Orpah, they're both like, no, no, we'll stay with you. And then eventually Orpah was like, listen, you ain't got to tell me twice. <laughs> y'all, eventually Orpah said, well, look, I mean, there might just be a man waiting for me back home. I mean, I know that means I got to go back and worship, worship these false gods. But, you know, there might be somebody waiting for me. You ain't got to tell me twice, Naomi. It's been real. <laughs> and amen, because that's how real the Bible is, y'all. I mean, tell you, I was having this conversation with somebody saying, like, listen, if you want some good drama, if that's what you're missing in your life, you ain't got to get that out of your romantic relationship with a no good man. Okay, just read your Bible. <laughs> you ain't got to have drama in your relationships. I promise. If you just read your Bible, baby, soap operas going on. Orpah said, okay, now I ain't going to beg you to be miserable. If you said that I can go, I'm out. Okay, cool. We Orpah was released, right? But then we have friends like Ruth. So one of the interesting things that was pointed out in um, the notes of this passage is that one of the recurring themes in verses six through maybe even 22 through the rest of the chapter is the word return. It's mentioned 12 times between verse six and verse 22. So that's the theme of the rest of the passage is every other verse you find the word return which is interesting to me because the place that Naomi and Ruth are going to experience the redemption 
is going to be in the returning, not in the place where they're at. And that was a word for me because the question that it prompted me to ask is when you find yourself at the end, at your wit's end, just as Naomi did here, ask God if there's anything he's calling you to return to. Is there a certain season with him that he's calling you to return to? He may be saying, remember when you was getting up at 5 a.m.? Being sure that you get your time in the word with me. Being sure that you get some good prayer time in. Remember when you were disciplined enough to be up before your kids? Okay? Return. Right? Is there a certain land he's calling you to return to? That one hit home for me because when I went through my divorce, he called me to return to Memphis. And I said, huh? Hey, well, Lord, you know, I didn't want to know. I just, can you just say it one more time? I just try to be sure you heard me right. You said, Memphis, return to Memphis. He said, return to Memphis, man. I said, <laughs> I said, okay. I mean, I'm going to go, right? <laughs> but I just don't understand why you would cause me to do such a thing, but I'm going to go, like we said last time, I don't, uh, I'm, I, I don't understand, I don't have words, but I'm going to go, right? Is there a certain land he's calling you to return to, a certain job he's calling you to return to, a certain heart posture that he's calling you to return to? Listen, woo, that heart posture, I'm about to, we're going to take it there, okay? Because listen. When we are in seasons of abundance, <laughs> Tay Tay said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> when we are in seasons of abundance, the faith don't hit the same. Hear me out, sis. When we, okay, so y'all, y'all telling my testimony, Hannah, y'all in the comments, Tay, hey, telling my testimony. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> when we are in seasons of abundance, the faith don't hit the same. And listen, I will be the first to testify that I say, give me the abundance anyway. <laughs> don't stretch my faith. Give me the abundance. But that heart posture, though, because one of the things that I used to say coming out of the roughest season of my life when I went through my divorce was, man, the circumstances, I could throw that away, could do without that. But the way that that intimacy with the Lord hit in that valley season, I can't I can't go without that. So that's the exchange that so many times the thing that we prize and the thing that we prioritize is the gift. But we don't we don't prioritize another level of faith. We're not ever like, man, God, give me more faith, because you know what comes with you asking for more faith is the circumstance that's going to give you more faith. When you say, God, I really want to be closer to you, but then you don't welcome the circumstance that's going to cause you to pray and force you to get into your word. You see what I'm saying? We prize the gift. We prize the gift, but we don't prize the process. We don't prize the aspect of the relationship with God that he's working out with us, which tells me our priorities are off. Ooh, the priorities are off because if we really had eternal focus, we say, man, God, when I see you, I want to be poured out. We say, don't have me come before you full. I want to be empty. Right. But then we don't welcome. <laughs> we don't welcome the very thing that's going to help us deny flesh, that's going to help us shed that weight of flesh, that's going to help us be poured out, that's going to help us drink from the well that never runs dry. We say, no, nah, pass me that bottle of water. I'm going to drink <laughs> from that right there. And in my abundance, you know, which is great. Like, Lord knows we are praying for all of the abundance because as sons and daughters of the king, it is ours for the taking. So hear me say that there is no spiritual maturity about lack. You know, that's not it. But what I'm talking about is heart posture 
in the meantime, because what Paul said was, I've learned to be content in every circumstance. Paul said, put me in a prison. I'm good. Put me in the lowest you can. I'm good because I've learned to be content in every circumstance when I'm high and when I'm low, because that's the ebb and flow of life. Like Warder said in the comments, we can't pick and choose. And listen, I'll be the first to admit I'm not there. I am not there whatsoever. OK, give me comfort. <laughs> and give me the life that I want. But I'm learning though, I'm learning as God has me in this season, what it looks like to continue to embrace that contentment despite the circumstances, because we all know that the reality is that we're going to get exactly what we want. And then a new need is going to present itself that is going to uh, threaten our contentment, that's going to threaten our security. So, okay, you're going to get the good paying job. Cool. Then what? Okay, your husband going to start acting right. Cool. Then what? Okay. <laughs> you know, like, and then what? Like, because that's the natural progression of life, y'all, is that because we live in a fallen world, because we are on this side of heaven, there are always going to be circumstances that present themselves to threaten our faith to threaten our commitment, our contentment, to threaten our security, because we got an enemy. He dare, he gonna go down swinging, okay? If Satan was a boxer, he'll be a fire boxer because he going down swinging. That man will not get up. He will not stay down, I mean. So yes, God will break you to position you. Yes, I love that song. And so I just want us to just have that right heart posture, right? That sometimes the blessing is in the returning. Sometimes the blessing is in the returning for us. So just have that time with God to ask him, what are you calling me to return to? And like my good sisters have said in the comments, baby, when I return to Memphis, okay, redemption, everything that I had lost repaid okay my mans was waiting on me okay my church community was waiting on me okay a new job was waiting on me okay all of the things that were in the returning all right so don't stay don't stay put for too long when he calling you to return because something just might be waiting for you on the other side all right and so we get to verse 13 and um, she says, no, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Uh, in the New Living Translation, verse 13 reads, things are far more bitter for me than for you because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. Oh, the country. But it's easy for us to feel like Naomi. It's easy for us to feel like, OK, God is allowing these things to happen in my life. So clearly he's not for me. <laughs> clearly he's against me. Oftentimes in the Bible, uh, you see people assume that there is some type of sin that's happening, either between them or the parents as to why something like this would be taking place. But on the contrary, this was a setup. Oh, it was a setup, y'all. We're not going to get through the entire story tonight um but what we what what goes on to happen as this story of redemption is carried out is that ruth ends up meeting her man right but not only does she end up meeting her man she also ends up being the great grandmother of king david and ends up being in the lineage of jesus okay talk about generational blessings Talk about <laughs> storing up treasures. She ain't even know, okay? She ain't even know. Like what? She's a great grandmother of David, a man after God's own heart. She ends up being in the lineage of Christ himself all because she went with Naomi to return. Come on, y'all. That's what the, what the commercials say, priceless, okay? You can't put a price tag on that. And that was all in the returning. Do you hear me? That was all in being loyal, that she was set up. But she didn't know that. She didn't know that. 
that's the catch, right? That she learned until after the fact. She had to be obedient first before all of these things, all of the trickle down effect came. And so all throughout these verses, uh, starting in verse six, we start to see Naomi's heart. She's like, y'all ain't got to suffer because I'm suffering. There's so much life ahead for y'all. And, and I wonder if maybe Naomi would be considered the strong friend, right? Naomi, the strong friend. I'm going to be good. <laughs> y'all go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to be okay. Naomi, she's going to return back home and she's going to figure it out, right? That's what she's thinking. Except, except she had a friend like Ruth. <sighs> Except she had a friend like Ruth that said, baby, I ain't letting you go. Where you go, I'm go where you think you're going without me? Where you go, I go. Where you die, I die. You know, these, these uh, words that Ruth spoke to Naomi are often used in vows, in marriage vows. And this is between two women. OK, where you go, I will go. That's the level of loyalty between friends. And that is the beauty of friendship. That's the beauty of community when done the right way, that people literally lay down their lives for you. Do you hear me? What kind of friend is this who going to give up everything that she's entitled to? Like her husband passed away. She 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 wouldn't she didn't have to stay here, you know. She didn't have any commitment to Naomi beyond that. But she said, no, 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 no. I'm going to stay here with you. The other thing that I love, 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 love about Ruth, and this one should hit home, is that it's so easy to forget because of Ruth's response that Ruth was grieving too. Ruth had lost her husband. Hello? Ruth had lost her husband, y'all. Ruth didn't have any kids. There was such high value placed on kids, on, ch on children during that time. She lost the golden ticket. It's like, well, shoot, you know, I lost my chance. I, I was married for all this time didn't have any kids, all of the realities, all of the possibilities, any of the dreams that she could have had about that life snatched. And I don't read anything about her grief. What? Come on. And I'm sure she grieved, but the Bible is intentional and in what it highlights. I don't, what, where, where is it? What, I'm, how did Ruth feel? I don't know. Cause she was so loyal to her friend that we don't even hear about her grief. <laughs> we don't hear about her being bitter. We don't hear about her questioning God because she was there for her friend. She said, listen, I'm going to put everything that I'm feeling on the back burner because my friend's selflessness. Yes, Teresa. What? What in the loyalty is this? What in the friendship? Yes, Bree, she grieved, but she didn't let her grief overcome her. She moved forward. She was not bitter. And what an example of Christ likeness. You go give up everything that you have the right to for somebody else. Did y'all catch that? Okay. You going to give up what you have, you have the right to return home. You have the right to marry again. You have the right. You're going to give that up for somebody else? Ain't nobody making you do it? This is out of loyalty? You telling Naomi her God is going to be your God? Say what? What in the deep friendship? What in the deep friendship do we have here? How is that going for y'all? How's the selflessness going for you, right? How is it for you? Are you willing to put your things aside for other people? Or are you so overcome by what you got going on that you can't see other people's pain? It doesn't negate your pain. It doesn't negate that what you're going through is also valid. What it does show us, though, is the beauty of community. Because if everybody going to choose to be focused on what they got going on, then ain't nobody available to be there for their neighbor. 
And that's, we doomed. We doomed if that's how we're going to choose to go about our relationships, that we can never put what we got going on aside to lay down our life for a friend, to sacrifice for a friend, to exemplify Christ's likeness for a friend, for a neighbor, for somebody unworthy, right? Because that's what Jesus did for us. We weren't worthy. We didn't do anything to deserve that. We was going to continue to mess up time and time again. And he said, mm, I'm, I'm going to leave everything that I'm entitled to. I'm going to leave the good life. Yes, willing, even not reciprocated. Because she Ruth didn't go into it saying, oh, I'm going because I know I'm going to meet my Boaz. She didn't know. <laughs> she didn't know. She signed up for the uncertainty. She signed up to be faithful, despite. She didn't have any guarantee that the Lord was going to come through. Faithfulness was the reward. She had no guarantee that it was going to get better. Okay, and let that be a lesson to us. Our obedience can't be with the goal in mind that we're going to be rewarded for. Because we might, we, we might not. We might not, not get our reward until heaven. <laughs> okay, heaven might be its own reward for your obedience. Is that enough? If you never see your reward on this side of heaven, is it enough? To hear, well done, my good and faithful servant one day, is that enough? Is that enough of a prize? Is that enough of a prize? Okay. Okay. So I want to end this out on a beautiful note that, you know, you read your Bible and things stand out to you that are just like now. I know. I done read this story so many times and I ain't never seen it like that before. And that's what I pray for when I prepare these for y'all. I'm like, Holy Spirit, highlight the things. Hey, Jocelyn, highlight the things. So the way that the first chapter ends, <laughs> the way that the first chapter ends, it says in verse 22. So Naomi returned to Moab Accompanied by her daughter-in-law, Ruth, the young Moabite woman, they arrived in Bethlehem in late spring at the beginning of the barley harvest. At the beginning of the barley harvest. It's harvest season, y'all. It's time to gather the crops. <laughs> Ooh, I said, What? What? Not the chapter going out with a banger. She returned. There that theme is again, right? Last verse. She returned with her daughter-in-law, Ruth. They, they didn't did the wrestling. They didn't did the back and forth. They have resolved. Ruth is coming with her. They arrived at the beginning of the barley harvest. And when you look up the word harvest, that just means it's time to go gather, gather the crop. <laughs> it's time to go gather the crop. They were just in the nick of time. They were just in the nick of time. Because you know what? Who's to say if they had left before those 10 years, if they would have been just in the nick of time? We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. All we know is the way that it happened is that God set them up for success so that when they did return, do you hear me? When they did return, they were just in time for the harvest. Man, I want y'all to catch that. I want y'all to catch that because everything that we read is about the wrestle. Everything that we read is about the wrestle. It's about the tussle. It's about the back and forth. It's about the drain trying to get there, <laughs> right? But when they do, it is just in the nick of time. And then in chapter two, Cubo ass, right? Okay. So praise the Lord, saints. <laughs> As the church says, praise the Lord, saints, because the way that the Holy Spirit took me through there in just chapter one, okay? So I encourage you all, Ruth is only four chapters. Um, continue reading through just in your own time with God, just asking the Holy Spirit to highlight to you 
what it is, whatever it is that you need in this season. We could all read it and something different be highlighted to us because the Lord is going to speak to us based on what we need. And so, man, I pray that that blesses you all and that that just gives you something to cling to, that that gives you some hope in the right ways that, man, I hope can't be in the circumstances looking good because all hope seem lost, right? So many things, the people had died. Her husband had died. Her sons had died. These two women, their husbands had died. Physically, it was no more. There, it didn't, they, they were no, they were no more, but God had a plan. There was a beautiful story of redemption, not just for their day, but for years to come in how God was going to move through the bloodline because of their obedience. All right, y'all, that is it for the Bible study tonight. Uh, for those of you in the radical community, uh, we're going to dive into this a little bit more in a couple of weeks, the third Tuesday. I'm um, in the Facebook group. I'm going to open up a private room for you all to be able to join me in. And we can just talk through this. You know, we can talk through what hit home, um, what we felt challenged by, what made us hopeful, and just be able to commune with one another on just how the spirit was speaking to us through this passage. So thank you all so much for joining me tonight for a little Bible study featuring Big E. Okay. If you were here at the beginning, Big E was his name. <laughs> I pray y'all have a really good rest of the night. Love y'all. Oh, Kaylin. Hey girl. <laughs> all right. Y'all have a good night.